Today we're going to look at the basic functioning of a power plant. So let's take a look at the basic parts and the basic functioning of a power plant. And this could be a nuclear power plant or a fossil fuel power plant. It doesn't really matter. So we start with some form of fuel and we burn that fuel and that produces heat of course. And the heat flows out into what's called the combustion chamber here. Now we don't want the pressure in the combustion chamber to become too high so we need an exhaust so that we can control the amount of pressure inside the combustion chamber. Most of the heat energy will flow into the boiler also called the heat exchanger and inside the boiler there is of course water and the water heats up it begins to boil and produces steam. The pressure of course becomes very high as the water boils. It becomes so high in fact that it pushes down on the water molecules and prevents them from breaking apart and that raises the boiling temperature. So we get what we call superheated water, water that's well above 100 degrees Celsius. And we get very very high pressure steam coming out of the boiler and it's directed down towards what's called a turbine. A turbine is a, a series of blades that look something like this and as that high pressure strikes these blades those blades will rotate and that rotation drives a shaft here and that shaft is connected to some very large coils of wire and the coils of wire are in a magnetic field and when we rotate the coils of wire inside the magnetic field electricity is produced. This is called a generator when we rotate a coil of wire inside of a magnetic field. You've probably seen hand generators like this one. In this one you rotate a crank here that causes this coil of wire to rotate and the coil of wire is inside of a magnetic field here. The blue and red rectangles here are magnets and when you do that the lights come on because electricity is being produced works exactly the same way in a power plant. Now the other side of the turbine needs to have low pressure steam otherwise the turbines aren't going to rotate. So the steam coming out of the turbine needs to be cooled. Now, typically we use water to cool off that steam coming out. And this area here, this system is called a condenser because what it does is it takes the steam and condenses it and turns it back into water as it cools off the steam. Once it's turned into water it can be pumped back into the boiler. So now you've got a cyclic system the steam and water flowing through that cycle. So overall we start out with some chemical or nuclear energy stored in the fuel that gets converted into heat energy in the boiler. This makes steam and the steam has a lot of kinetic energy and it pushes the turbines so their movement would be another form of kinetic energy and then we finally output the electrical energy. This initial form of energy is called the primary energy and this final form of energy is called the secondary form of energy. And we really like electrical energy as a secondary form of energy because it's so versatile. We can use electrical energy to charge up batteries, to rotate motors, to produce heat. Whatever you want, it's really easy to make conversions from electrical energy into any other form of energy. So here's a Sankey diagram outlining the energy flows for a typical power plant. So here's your primary energy, or the energy stored within the fuel. Out of 100 units, about 30% of that would go into electricity. And that's our secondary energy source. So about 70% of the energy does get lost in a power plant. Approximately 15% is lost from the exhaust gases from the combustion chamber. Almost half of the energy is lost at the condenser. 
That's where the steam is cooled down and turned back into water so that the cycle can be repeated. But we've also got moving parts in the turbine and we need pumps to push the water around that cycle. They're going to use up approximately 5% of our energy. The remaining 30% is the good stuff, that most versatile form of energy, electricity. Now, if we want to compare the different types of power plants, say a coal power plant compared to an oil power plant compared to a nuclear power plant, then we'd like to compare how effective those fuels are. If we have a coal power plant, we have to keep all kinds of reservoirs of coal because we have to burn a large quantity of coal in order to get a sufficient amount of energy being produced. If we have a nuclear power plant, then with the nuclear fuel, a little bit of nuclear fuel will produce a large amount of energy. So we have these two concepts called the energy density and the specific energy of a fuel. The energy density, well, a density is a mass per unit volume. An energy density will be a energy per unit volume. So it's going to be energy divided by volume. And the units there would be joules, using SI units, joules per meter cubed. So if we had an energy density of 15 joules per meter cubed, that would mean that one meter cubed would produce 15 joules of energy. The specific energy refers to the energy being produced per unit mass. So its units are going to be joules in SI units, joules per kilogram. So far specific energy was 15 joules per kilogram. One kilogram of that fuel would produce 15 joules of energy. Here we have an energy density chart and it's plotting this volumetric density against gravimetric density. But if we look here at the units, we've got energy units divided by volume units. So this volumetric density is really what the IB calls the energy density. And this gravimetric density is energy per unit mass. So this is really what the IB calls the specific energy. So we can make a few observations on this chart. Here we've got some gases. So they have a high gravimetric density. That's nice because because a small mass of fuel will produce a lot of energy. And that typically would make gases easy to transport, but not so much because they have such a low volumetric density, such a low energy density. So you're going to have to transport something with a very large volume. For the steam train engine, wood just didn't cut it. It wasn't a good enough fuel. And coal was required for the steam engines. And that comes down to the specific energy and the energy density. You're going to need a large mass of wood on the train and that's going to increase the inertia of the train. You're also going to need a very large volume of wood. So you're not going to be able to store all the wood in a small compartment on the train. It's going to have to take up a couple of cars if you're going a considerable distance. So coal with the higher volumetric density and the higher gravimetric density was a key factor in the development of the steam engine. So here we have a very typical question involving energy density. So pause the video, read the question over, try it out, come back for the answer. So I'm given three numbers in this problem. Let's just try to sort those numbers out. The first number is this 10 billion joules produced each second. So it's joules per second. That's really a power. And it's being produced, so that's really an output power. Our output power is 10. It's a billion, so times 10 to the ninth power. And that would be joules every second. Or we could say it was 10 gigawatts, the output power. Our efficiency... That's the 0 0.3. And immediately I see here that I can work out the input power because efficiency is equal to the output power, the good stuff that comes out, versus the input power, what you got to give up. And that means our 
input power must be equal to the output power over the efficiency or 10 times 10 to the ninth power divided by 0 0.3 and if you work that out you get 33 times 10 to the ninth power of joules every second in other words 33 gigawatts of power have to be input from the fuel into the power plant and now my third number is this 24 mega times 10 to the sixth joules per kilogram I usually use a symbol rho with an M to represent this specific energy or the gravimetric energy density. And I would use a rho with a V for the volumetric energy density. And of course, it would have units of joules per meter cubed. Now, if I just kind of think in terms of units here, my input power well, power is watts, so that's joules per second. And my energy density is joules per kilogram. So if I could multiply the number of joules per kilogram times the number of kilograms every second, of course the kilograms are going to cancel out, and I'd get joules per second. And that really gives me an equation here. My input power is going to equal the specific energy, the number of joules per kilogram, times the number of kilograms of fuel burnt every second. So I'll call that delta M over delta T, the rate at which the mass is being combusted. And then if I rearrange that, the rate at which the mass is combusted is going to equal my input power divided by the energy density. Input power was that 33 times 10 to the ninth joules per second. Energy density was the 24 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. If I divide that, I get 1.4 times 10 to the 3rd kilograms every second. So we're going to have to burn, we're going to have to combust 1,400 kilograms of fuel every second in order to produce this 10 gigawatts of power. So we started this video by talking about the basic parts of a power plant and we started with the fuel in the combustion chamber and that would heat up water in a boiler. The water would become superheated, produce high pressure steam which would then drive a turbine and the turbine would produce electricity about 30 percent of the input energy would come out as useful electricity. Now that steam coming out of the turbine would have to be cooled down and we'd use a condenser for that. We'd have to pump that water, liquid water coming out of the condenser back into the boiler so that you'd get this cyclic process. So key parts were the turbine, the condenser, pump and the fuel. We're going to have losses due to the exhaust gases, usually about 15 percent. Most of our losses will come from the condenser, about 50 percent there. And then another 5 percent due to the moving parts in the turbine and the pump. We then talked about the energy density of a fuel. We said it was measured in joules per meter cubed or, or energy units divided by volume units and the specific energy which was measured in joules per kilogram so it would be the number of joules produced for every kilogram of fuel. And that's all for today folks. Thank you very much.